Meteorites Rock. Welcome back to the Cosmic Companion. This week on Meteorites Rock, we're going to look at the role meteorites play in shaping our planet and the history of the human race. We're going to be talking with Greg Brennica, author of Impact, How Rocks from Space Led to Life, Culture, and Donkey Kong. Now, Earth is constantly impacted by material from space. Most of this debris is small, say the size of an apple seed or smaller. Now, as these pebbles from space race through our atmosphere, they burn away as meteors or shooting stars, which can sometimes be seen by curious eyes gazing upward to the heavens. This debris consists of bits of rock, ice, and metal which float throughout the inner solar system. As comets race around the sun, they leave behind trails of ice and rock. Around 30 times a year, the Earth encounters these debris trails, creating our annual meteor showers. Occasionally, some of these larger meteors survive their incendiary sojourn through our atmosphere, landing on the Earth as meteorites. Significant numbers of meteors do reach the surface of our world. These visitors from space accumulate around our planet at a rate of around one meteorite per square kilometer per year. Now, to put that in perspective, for a region the size of Arizona, that works out to nearly 300,000 new meteors every year. Now, desert areas like Arizona are among the best places to hunt for meteors. Low levels of precipitation help preserve the samples and wide open areas assist researchers in their search for this precious material from space. Recognizing a meteor among thousands of terrestrial rocks in a field can often be a challenge. A field magnet is often the best tool to recognize the difference between a meteorite and a meteor wrong. Long ago, as our distant ancestors walked around their local neighborhood, they would, once in a while, come across odd-looking rocks, often heavy for their size. Some of these could be shaped into primitive tools and weapons. Around 3300 BCE, climate change was affecting the planet. A population which once foraged the land began raising sheep, goat, and cattle in an ancient version of working from home. Living in close quarters with horses brought people a means of transportation, equine camaraderie, and the plague, which ravaged Europe as the earliest human cities like Uruk began to take shape. Around that same time, Egyptians began to make use of iron, as seen in a necklace found from a gravesite of the period. The pharaoh Tutankhamun was entombed with at least 19 objects thought to be composed from iron samples collected from meteorites. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time, and the oldest light in the universe hold secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth, and we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. 
Thank you. We talked with Greg Grenica about his new book, Impact, How Rocks from Space Lake to Life, Culture, and Donkey Kong. This week on The Cosmic Companion, we're happy to be joined by Dr. Greg Brennica. He is a cosmochemist at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, and he is the author of one of the funnest books you're ever going to read about asteroids, Impact, How Rocks from Space Led to Life, Culture, and Donkey Kong. Welcome to the show, Greg. Thanks a lot. It's cool to be here. Yeah. So uh, what led you to write this book? It, it, it was the Donkey Kong thing, wasn't it? <laughs> it was the Donkey Kong thing. <laughs> yeah. No, actually, uh, you know, I think like yourself, uh, a big fan of, of, you know, popularizing science and getting cool things out to people that don't necessarily study science. And I was noticing, uh, actually reading Bill Bryson's Short History of Nearly Everything, uh, mm -hmm. I reread that fairly recently, and uh, after That's studying fun. meteorites for about a decade, I felt like there was a big hole there, and uh, and and you know there needed to be some popular science literature on meteorites and kind of their you know influence on the planets and and what they've done for us as as humans as well. So that's kind of what started it. That's fabulous. And so, um, can you just give us a? I know this is a long answer. Can you just give us a brief intro to how asteroids have affected? Earth, both before humans and while we've been here. Sure. Um, well, so as you as you know, uh, you know, asteroids are you know kind of large bodies that kind of float around the solar system. Most of them they're contained in the asteroid belt, uh, and we have a lot of the chunk the chunks of those on Earth in the form of meteorites. Uh, so meteorites are generally thought of as the small pieces of asteroids that make it make it to Earth. And you know, this is a like you said, it's a very broad answer, but you know, they've been landing on Earth. Uh, you know, since the solar system was created, since Earth was created, uh, you know, meteorites and, and asteroid impacts are, are what caused the moon to form. Uh, so that's why we have a moon. So that's a, a pretty big deal for Earth and, and you know, its evolution as a planet. Uh, you know, it, it has delivered, uh, meteorites have delivered all sorts of raw materials like organic material, uh, amino acids, things like this, um, you know, have, have been brought to Earth uh, from meteorites. Uh, they bring a lot of precious metals. So when the Earth formed, a lot of the precious metals went to the core. Um, so we wouldn't have access to things like palladium or iridium or gold that we make a lot of high-end electronics. And this is kind of where the Donkey Kong comes in, uh, is that if it wasn't for meteorites delivering a lot of these precious metals uh, kind of later after the, the core of the Earth formed, then we would have no high-end electronics at all. And obviously I consider Donkey Kong a high-end electronics, so who wouldn't, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. What I mean... That's what you're going to do in 1983, play Prince of Persia. Yeah, come on. I don't think <laughs> the so. The storyline was just terrible. <laughs> <laughs> indeed, indeed. And then, of course, you know, just to, to kind of finish up with that, you know, it's not just raw materials and, and things like that that meteorites have brought. Uh, they've really influenced culture. Um, and, and, you know, the, the evolution and the arc of a lot of religions has, has changed considerably due to meteorite interactions. Uh, you know, so there's, you pick, basically pick any religion or, or ancient culture, uh, and they've had major inflection points due to, you know, meteorites or meteorite impacts and things like that. So, you know, I, I didn't realize this uh, a lot before I started getting into the book, uh, how important some of these, um, you know, meteorite impacts were for various religions. Um, and I just found it a really fascinating topic to explore. Absolutely. And techno, and seems like, you know, meteorites have, and have really been partly responsible for kicking off, um, as you alluded to, you know, some of the biggest advances in the human race, the Iron Age, the Bronze Age, the Iron Age, and now the Electronics Age. Right. Yeah. I mean, we, I guess it's, it's kind of crazy to think that we have all those different things to, you know, to look at and, and thank meteorites for. Uh, you know, it's, it's pretty crazy. It's certainly not something a lot of people think about. Yeah, how do you how do you see um, meteorites playing a role in the future of human development? Well, I mean, of course, uh, you know, 
Hollywood likes to popularize a lot of things. Obviously, a lot of people have probably seen Armageddon and then more recently, you know, Don't Look Up, uh, you know, in the form of a comet. Um, but a lot of people are looking at, at asteroids for mining purposes. Um, and, and a lot of times we will study meteorites to, to understand that type of thing. I also think academically they're incredibly valuable. And I think most people in my field uh, would probably agree with me about looking at um, exoplanets and, and what uh, other star systems are like. Um, we, can, we can gain a lot of information by looking at meteorites because they contain a lot of that primitive information of a, of a stellar system. All right, and we're learning a whole lot from the first missions that have gone and are, are headed to asteroids. Um, you know, Hayabusa 2, uh, Psyche, um, you know, and um, Osiris Rex, essentially. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so what can those missions and studying these objects in space teach us about the meteorites that land on Earth and vice versa? So, of course, when we get meteorites, they're kind of random. You know, we don't really know where they come from for the most part. Uh, we're just kind of lucky to get them. Uh, I kind of like to think of missions like, you know, OSIRIS-REx and Hayabusa 2 and Hayabusa as going to the meteorites. Uh, you know, so, uh, you know, we're basically saying, okay, now we know where these are located. We want to find out more about these, these asteroids and what they're like before they enter Earth's atmosphere. Because, of course, you know, they're fairly pristine when they land. And if we collect them quickly, then there's not a lot of terrestrial contamination. Um, but, of course, you know, something going through the atmosphere, uh, you know, at, at 40 times the speed of a bullet, and, you know, melting a little bit of it, uh, you know, things happen to that meteorite that wouldn't happen in a space collection. So I think it's really cool that we're able to do these types of missions to kind of go to the meteorites to really collect them and see how pristine they are and, and, and really kind of validate some of the things we've looked at for in meteorites throughout the years. Yeah. And um, so I, you brought this up, so, so I'm not responsible for this. <laughs> Well, as as a uh, geochemist and someone who studies space, what what was your opinion of Don't Look Up? <laughs> I thought it was funny. Um, you know, I, it's it's you know kind of both funny and sad at the same time. Of course, uh, you know, I, I thought it was it was a you know pretty entertaining movie. I'm not going to get into the science of it or you know all the politics of it, but uh, I enjoyed it. I thought it was a funny movie, and uh, I, I I like that they do that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I thought it was, it, it was definitely worth a few chuckles, I thought. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so one of the, you know, things that I think people might be most interested in or, you know, surprised by might be that, you know, some of these pieces that we're collecting even within, um, as I understand it, you know, some meteorites are going to find some organic materials. Mm -hmm. You know, so how did how did those get there? How do those form, and, and what makes yeah, them I mean, so it, special? It, it totally blew my mind when I was in graduate school and found out that there are amino acids that are contained in certain types of meteorites, and it just totally blew my mind. I thought, well, amino acids, of course, they all form on Earth. You know, that's what life uses. That's how we, you know, um, kind of define our our evolution. You know, getting to to amino acids and things like this. But when I found out they're created in the outer solar system. Uh, and our contained in meteorites that are then brought to us, I just, it really just kind of blew my mind. Uh, and, and the way this happens is really interesting. I mean, there's obviously a lot of carbon, there's a lot of hydrogen, there's a lot of nitrogen, you know, all these kind of raw materials, raw elements uh, that are present in the cosmos all over the place. Um, right. And then, of course, when it's cold, they form in ices. There's a lot of water as well in the form of ice. So, you know, things like beyond Saturn, uh, you know, there's a lot of ice particles. And if you've got ice particles with a carbon and a hydrogen and a nitrogen, and you, you know, have UV radiation, which is very common in, in the cosmos, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you end up forming amino acids. You form different types of, you know, biologically essential uh, materials. And then, of course, those get collected uh, as meteorites form, as asteroids form. Uh, and then, you know, sometimes they're lucky enough to make it to Earth or we're lucky enough to get them, I guess. Um, so it just, you know, like I said, it totally blew my mind when I figured, or found out that that's uh, how possibly a lot of the amino acids in the, the biosphere on Earth was, was created. Right, right. And so, of course, not only Earth, but that could also, you would think those same processes could also occur on other exoplanets, potentially exactly. greatly increasing the 
the chances for life elsewhere. Yes, that is not too big of a leap to make uh, mentally, I don't think. I mean, if we see it happening in kind of random rocks outside of Saturn, uh, there's no reason this isn't happening all around, uh, you know, the galaxy and uh, basically any any stellar system that has uh, the, you know, similar type type materials and stars. Mm -hmm. And so what do you think is, you know, one of the things that, you know, about meteorites that fascinates you the most that... Yeah, you know, most people might not know. Um, I would almost just say the diversity of materials that we find. I mean, you know, there's, we touched on organics quite a bit. That one certainly is uh, a very important one for Earth. Uh, you know, there's materials that are basically fossils of dead stars. So pre-solar grains are contained in meteorites. So it's, it's something that existed prior to our solar system forming. Uh, I found that to be, I find that to be a very fascinating topic. Um, you know, we have a lot of range of meteorites. Some of them are very primitive and have never been melted. Um, so we get a lot of information about the very early solar system. Um, and some of them are, you know, chunks of Mars. Some of them are, are chunks of the moon. Um, so we have a lot of, you know, pieces of Mars, which we wouldn't have otherwise in the form of meteorites. Um, so I think just the diversity of geologic materials that we see uh, in meteorites is, is what kind of blows me away as, a, as someone who studies rocks. Uh, it's, it's not something we see on Earth, really. All right, so um, can you give, give us a little bit of a hint of like what that diversity looks like? Is it, you know, different types of stone, metal, mm -hmm. mixtures? What are, what are we looking at? Yeah, so I know, I know uh, you know, a lot of this is on podcasts, but I have a couple I just want to show you. There's, there's a... Uh, a wide diversity, like I said, and some of these are like cores of planets. So we can't, yeah. we can't get to our core of our planet, but we have iron meteorites, which are basically the cores of asteroids. And for those of you who can, can see this, this is, this is kind of one that uh, is, would be an iron meteorite. Uh, so that's, that's one example. It's basically pure iron and nickel. Uh, there's some impurities, but uh, we don't, we can't make uh, metals like that. Uh, that, that have that type of crystalline structure because we can't get to the pressures and, and temperatures involved. Um, so I find, you know, that's really interesting. And then, of course, you know, you've got, you know, very carbon-rich meteorites that are almost 20% water in some cases. So they're almost like a sponge, uh, you know, that's not really wrung out very well. Um, so that's, you know, a really dark, uh, you know, or organic-rich meteorite uh, with a lot of water in it. So. That is absolutely, absolutely fascinating. So if, what is your biggest question or questions that you still want to know about meteorites that's, that's not known yet? Uh, that is, that is a great question. Uh, I mean, I think to me, they, they hold all the clues to how our solar system formed and evolved. Um, so, you know, for a very broad answer, I think just looking at the first, you know, one to five million years of our solar system is only possible through looking at meteorites. Um, and I, I think them holding the clues to how we formed as planets, uh, you know, how planets form and, and how Earth kind of received all the materials, uh, a lot of that information that we have is, is locked up in meteorites. And certainly some of it we have, have uncovered and there's gonna be a lot that we haven't. And I guess that's kind of why we do what we do um, is, is because, you're just learning so much about how stellar systems form and evolve. Um, and, and looking at weird looking rocks is, is I guess, the way to do it. Uh, you know, <laughs> if you can look, if you have a chance to look at a weird looking rock, do it. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good, you know what? That, I couldn't say it better myself. That was, that's great. <laughs> that's fabulous. It was great talking with you, Greg. It's a lot yes, of likewise. fun. This is a lot of fun. Yeah. And welcome back anytime. And that was Dr. Bre uh, Greg Brennica, cosmochemist at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratories and author of Impact, How Rocks from Space Led to Life, Culture, and Donkey Kong. Um, meteorites are classified into three major groups depending on their composition. Iron meteorites are not surprisingly made almost completely from iron. Stony meteorites are composed largely of stone, while stony iron meteorites fall 
somewhere between the two extremes. Iron meteorites, which also, by the way, contain nickel, likely formed in the cores of asteroids billions of years ago. These meteorites resemble material found near the core of our planet. Stony meteorites called chondrites can contain some of the oldest material of the solar system, some of it more than four and a half billion years old. Now, the carbonaceous chondrites contain water, sulfur, and organic material, which may possibly have helped spark life here on Earth long ago. Achondrites can come from asteroids, the moon, or Mars. They are formed in magma, similar to that which formed the inner planets, including Earth. Incredibly, some meteorites found on Earth were once parts of other worlds, notably the Moon and Mars. And meteors, meteorites have been found on both of those worlds in turn. Now, we hope to find you with us next week as we look at the future of living in space with Paul Albert LeBron product manager at Kepler Communications, building the internet in space. Kind of cool, huh? Watch all our episodes at thecosmiccompanion.tv and visit us at thecosmiccompanion.com or thecosmiccompanion.net. Here's wishing you all clear skies.